and uh, thank you to everyone for coming to this Archaeology uh, Institute research seminar, which we hold on the last Friday of every month. Uh, we'll just wait for a, a couple of minutes, get everyone. Uh, we've got a huge uh, attendance list today, which is really exciting. Really glad you've all turned out for this. Uh, so we'll just wait for everyone to come in. And I'll just talk a little bit through the kind of WebEx housekeeping uh, while we're waiting to get started. So this is, uh, you'll be on mute, uh, you have your camera off, and what we can do is use the um, the chat function to kind of send messages, And but you can also put, there's a Q&A uh, function where you can put questions for our speaker, Kenny Brophy, today, and then after his talk, I will chair those and we'll have time for a bit of a discussion. Um, Okay, so um, with uh, I'm delighted that we've got Kenny Brophy here today, and it's very exciting to have you here, Kenny, because your work, you're a longtime friend of Orkney Archaeology and the Archaeology Institute here, and um, do lots of fantastic work. Uh, Kenny is senior lecturer in archaeology at the University of Glasgow. Uh, he also does wears many many hats. Coordinator of the Neolithic Studies Group. Uh, on the panel of Scotland's rock art project and he's also the urban prehistorian which he's and he's got a, a, a blog and a twitter account under that uh, handle so um, with no further ado I'm going to hand over to Kenny who's going to talk about his project the Cockno Stone in Faithley and community archaeology and rock art so thank you very much Kenny thanks Antonia for that welcome and um, it's a pleasure to be here talking to uh, UHI and all the other people in the audience. And it's amazing to see so many people here on a, a Friday afternoon. And I guess this feels like the, um, in a sense, it's just the end of a of one chapter with the, um, the story so far of the Cockno Stone and Faithler Rocks and, and very much at the beginning of the next chapter of resuming field work and other activities in the coming weeks and months um, as we come out of lockdown. Uh, because I literally haven't been to any of the, the sites I'm going to talk about, or even to Faithley, uh, since February 2020. So that's something I'm hoping to rectify now that I can legally leave North Lanarkshire. Um, so that's one of the first things I'm going to be doing in the next few weeks. Uh, so yeah, so today I'm going to be talking um, about sites that are um, in perhaps not the most glamorous archaeological location, and um, just on the edge of the housing estate of Faithley, which is in the north side of Clyde Bank in Western Bartonshire, which is uh, about half an hour's drive from Glasgow city centre. And what I want to do is to give you a bit of a background to the, the archaeology there and some of the um, and some of the interesting stories that I've been able to use in working with the community. But then I also want to focus on various different activities that have happened beyond the, the, the kind of the traditional archaeology. And actually, this project is really for me not so much about ancient and prehistoric stuff, but much more about the, the relevance to that for people today and how that might help change lives going into the future. So uh, for me, it's been it's been a real a really exciting process to go from having relatively little understanding or knowledge of the archaeology or this place to becoming to be very attached to all of it. And that's something I want to share. I mean, I, I suspect some of you might have heard me talking about the Cock and Stone before, so forgive me if I repeat some of that again. Um, but it's very useful just to have to know about the, the 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 inspiring, but also the weird story of that rock art as well. Um, to and and then how that's played out within the various uh, work that I've been doing over the last five or six years. Oh, need to change slide. There we go. So, before I, I start to talk about the archaeology, um, it's worth just looking here at a couple of maps which are really what underpins the the whole of the of the work i've been doing so in this this is not a map actually of course it's a satellite um, aerial image from uh, the scotland's rock art project website and it shows uh, all of the blue dots in this image are rock art sites a few of them are probably not rock art sites with natural markings but most of them are are genuine sites and as you can see there's a really big concentration of these sites in a in essentially an urban location um, and you can see all of the houses and so on, which is which is essentially faithfully and also Duntalker off to the left. Um, and th th and so this is that this juxtaposition is what drew me to this place in the first place, because as Antonia has said, I am the urban prehistorian, 
and therefore I'm interested in how prehistory presents itself within urban environments. And this is a perfect example of where you can have a, a bunch of archaeological sites that are regarded as maybe being secondary or not as of great importance or challenging or damaged in some way. But actually, when you dig beneath the surface, you can really find exciting and interesting things to say and do. The other map that I want to contrast that with is the um, the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation Data, which is governed, which is gathered by the Scottish Government. In fact, this data has since been updated in the last eighteen months, I think, but it hasn't changed. the The, the picture basically is is that Faithfully is by any standards a place that's regarded as deprived. Um, the redder the the colour on the image, the the worse a whole range of social indicators are from things like employment to life expectancy to things regarded related to um, crime, education and housing quality, etc. So you've got this area here, which is Faithley, next to the rock art, which is one of the most deprived areas in, in Scotland. Uh, and the thing that's really fascinating about this is what is this, is this kind of really very, very kind of west of Scotland contrast, because a mile away to the east, you've got the blue of Bear's Den. Which is one of the most one of the wealthiest places in Scotland, and and Bears Den has got its own incredible archaeological resource with the the Antonine Wall, which passes just to the south of um, of Faithley. So this is so not only we're we working an area with um, with archaeology that's in an urban environment, where prehistory and urban environment. We're also working in a place where um, we have uh, lots of social issues and problems and challenges, and and a place that has a perception externally. That it's a it's a bad place to live. That it's rubbish. That um, faithfully is is a problem place, and that's something which is challenging for the people who live there. But also presents an exciting opportunity when you're talking about an incredible five thousand year old resource. So let's go and look, have a little chat about the archaeology now. Well, let's just get this out of the way right now. Um, throughout this talk, of course, I'll refer to cup and ring marks uh, on a number of occasions because that's the how the archaeology presents itself. Um, and these are these uh, concentric circular symbols, which probably date to the late Neolithic, maybe 3000 to 2500 BC, probably a bit later as well, carved on rock outcrops across much of um, Britain and Ireland and other bits of Northwestern Europe. And we don't have a clue what the symbols mean, although there's, there are lots of different theories, over 100. In fact, as, as um, Ronald Morris documented back in the 1980s, Ronald Morris was a solicitor he was also an amateur rock art hunter and did some incredible work. And interestingly for me, his first real engagement with rock art was in Western Bartonshire. His first publication about rock art was about the, the these sites that I'm going to talk about today. Um, so it's really nice to revisit some of the work that he did. And I've been dipping into his files, which are an absolutely tre absolute treasure trove of information. If anyone's looking for a dissertation or a, a, a PhD topic, Ronald Morris's archive is absolutely perfect and it's ripe for investigation and um, so and ronald boris is the old gentleman in the left in that picture incidentally not the not the, the the younger guy with the beard so i'm not going to try and explain what cup and ring marks mean what the symbols are all about but this is part of the excitement because when you go into schools and talk to school kids and then you say to them what do you think these symbols mean they come up with lots of great and exciting ideas that are probably about as good as anything an archaeologist has ever come up with so there's a great opportunity there to enthuse young minds okay so let's go to the cockno stone and just introduce that site well this is a site that um, was first documented in the late 1880s the first published account, in fact, was in the London Illustrated News, bizarrely, in 1890. Um, once he'd stopped writing about Jack the Ripper, they moved on to the Cockno Stone. And here we have a, a few extracts of the stone from when it was cleared by the Reverend Harvey and um, Reverend Monroe. And it showed a couple of square metres of some very substantial and nice cup and ring marks. The whole stone itself was uncovered in 1895 by William Donnelly and John Bruce who subsequently wrote up um, what they discovered uh, for PSES, published in 1896. And this drawing by Donnelly is difficult to make sense of because it doesn't really capture the scale of the stone. The stone is about 15 metres by 8 metres in size. As you'll see in photos later on, it's kind of hog-backed in its shape, and it's covered in at least 100 individual prehistoric symbols. Yes, and it's, it's about um, over 100 square metres. It's an incredibly, um, it's incredibly dense and large panel, one of the biggest um, of its type in Britain. 
And I've just flagged up in the bottom of the slide, one of the more quirky elements of this, um, this site is these, this pair of footprints that were recorded by Donnelly carved into the stone, um, both of which have notably got four toes. Uh, and so this is one of the one of the mysteries of the site. You know, are these prehistoric carvings? Maybe are they more recent um, graffiti or image that's been added later on? That's a possibility. But if you're thinking about um, branding and about trying to excite people about this, this site and do something distinctive with it, then these kind of little details are really are really important and significant. And again, it's something that school kids really find fascinating because they try and speculate on what type of beastie had these strange feet. Now, the story of the Cockano Stone takes on um, a, a life of its own when we get to 1937, uh, when the, the Glas Glasgow eccentric antiquarian stroke archaeologist Ludwig Mann intervened uh, with a, one of the most dramatic acts of uh, prehistoric site vandalism ever documented in Europe, I would say, when in 1937 he covered almost the entire surface of the stone in oil paints. And you can see here, man, uh, the older gentleman with the white hair, with his helper George Appleby in 1937, um, posing on the stone with their elaborate paint job um, exposed for all to see. And they're looking roughly at the kind of the focal point of the of the paint, the paint that's been added to the stone. Now, obviously, this caused a massive stushy at the time when this happened. And by the end of 1937, the stone had become a scheduled ancient monument. But before that, it wasn't. But it really annoyed the heritage authorities, and it also very much annoyed the landowners as well of the site who were concerned about visitors coming to see this, what was literally now a multicoloured um, rock art site, whereas previously it had been just a brown stone with some markings carved into it. And so here you have the real scale of what of the stone and also of what man had done, because ostensibly man did this for a visit of the Glasgow Archaeology Society in September 1937. and you can see here um, the, the gas members wandering about in the stone, some of them with kilts, some with plus fours, which is the standard um, garb for field trips in those days, I guess. And the and I guess man was probably leading this trip by pointing out different aspects of the stone and um, giving a bit of a, an entertaining lecture, I'm sure. Um, he was a very eccentric character. But what this image really is showing us is the scale of the stone. You can see that there are people standing on the top of this mound-like um, hump on the stone. And you can also see uh, these incredible straight lines that man painted all over the stone, which are in some cases eight metres long. And also hints at, despite the fact it's a black and white photograph, there are hints that there are different colours of paint as well. So these big symbols, these kind of big cup and ring marks in the left centre of the photo, are definitely painted in at least two different colours. And subsequently, we found on a, when we did some excavation work here that they are green and white, and the grid lines are yellow. So this is this would have been a stunning sight, although probably quite disturbing for most of the archaeologists who visited this site in the 1930s. Anyway, as I mentioned earlier on, this caused all sorts of um, unhappiness. So the landowner wrote a letter to the Ministry of Works or the Office of Works complaining. The Office of Works wrote memos, and then they scheduled the ancient monument, and. This started a bit of a process over a few decades of, of discussions about what to do about this site, because there was clearly other things happening here as well. I mean, man's activities here almost certainly emboldened other people to leave their own mark on the stone as well. And so we know in the 30s, 40s, 50s and 60s that people were visiting the stone and carving their name onto it. Uh, and there was probably other things happening on there as well, some fires being lit and people walking over the stone. And there was a general sense that it was being damaged. And the landowners didn't want any, to take any responsibility for that, so they were really unhappy because they didn't want to have to pay for repairs. And they were also unhappy about people from the nearby, as it says in this letter on the left, the nearby industrial districts visiting this uh, monument and cluttering up the countryside with their urban ways. And, it's, and it, this is a time also in these decades when urbanisation was creeping closer and closer to Cockno, because when man painted it, it was out in the middle of nowhere. But by the 1950s and 60s, there was people living within five, ten minutes walk in in, in, in the, the estate at Faithley, who had probably, who had in some ways, in some part uh, cases, had been moved out from the, the centre of Glasgow and Clyde Bank. So in this changing environment, eventually in 1965, the decision was taken by the Ancient Monuments Board to bury the stone to protect it from any further damage. And this was done in spring 1965. And the stone was covered in 
50 to centimetres to a metre's worth of soil. Uh, and essentially that was it. There was no consultation with the local community. And also there was no long-term plan as to what was going to happen next or what was the end game. And so essentially it was buried forever because there was never any discussion about, well, okay, we'll leave it for 10 years and then think about it or... That was just it. So it was buried and then it just became a bit of a footnote in the history of Scottish archaeology. So, um, although it, it lived on in the memories of the local community, as you see. So if you visit um, the Cockno Stone today, uh, this is essentially what it looks like. It's a grassed over mound with a lot of um, parkland and vegetation. It's in a kind of an urban park that's quite wild and overgrown. And the stone itself has just got grass on top. It looks quite nice and, and uh, tidy here because after I did some excavation work here, um, it became a much tidier monument in terms of vegetation. Before this, when I visited in 2015, there was about a metre's worth of weeds growing on top of it, and it was almost impossible to make out where the site actually was. But essentially, there's nothing to see there now. There's not indicated as where it is, and it's very much a missing site. And it's interesting, I've spoken to quite a few people who grew up in Faithley, um, or, or they went to see the stone after man had painted it when they were children, and then they came back maybe 40 or 50 years later, and they couldn't find the stone, and they were completely puzzled as to wh where it had gone, and they just thought, oh, well, I must have forgotten where it was. And in fact, it was because it was buried, and no one had been told it had been buried. So this was a this is a kind of a, a problem that lingers in the memory of both local people and also the Faithfully diaspora. Uh, so... Around the 50th anniversary of its, of the burial of the stone, I was invited by a Spanish um, digital heritage company, Factum Arte, to um, take part in a, an excavation and a digital recording process at the Cockno Stone. And in 2015, we did a little trial trench just to check the Cockno Stone was definitely there and to give a bit of an assessment of what state it was in. And it was, it was there and it was in good nick underneath the soil. So we were able to proceed and in 2016, for a, over a period of three weeks, we we un, we removed all of the soil on top of the Cockno stone, and then we carried out digital recording before burying it again. And we had to bury it again because that was a condition of us being allowed to do the work in the first place by HES and the, land, the, the landowners. The site currently owned partly by a private landowner and partly by Western Bartonshire Council. So essentially what we did was we just removed all of the the topsoil that had been dumped there in 1965, and this was removed by a, a, a very dedicated pair of guys who, who had a mini digger and a dumper truck, which just spent a whole week in rain of just removing all the soil on top of the stone. Um, and we only, But we only used that down to a certain level above the surface of the stone. And then beyond that, we had to use plastic and rubber tools. So we had um, like, you know, plastic snow shovels and you know, even the kind of the little shovels that kids use on the beach to build sandcastles. We were using all those kind of things to try and make sure we didn't scrape and damage the stone because it's a very soft sandstone. And um, once we'd got rid of all the stuff, uh, all of the soil on top, after about a week of this going on, um, which was a very difficult process, we then had the good fortune to have the Clydebank Fire Brigade come on site for a few hours and literally hose down the whole of the rock so that we were able to record it without having silt within the features and then, you know, leaves lying about and all of the stuff that just had accrued even after we'd opened up. And it really made the, the stone sing for us as um, spectators. It was a spectacular couple of hours, very emotional couple of hours really for all the team members who were there um, to see not only this incredible stone revealed in all of its glory, but also to see Ludovic Mann's paint still extant in some bits of the stone. And also we realised very quickly huge amounts of graffiti as well. So this was a really exciting moment. And then it allowed us to take undertake recording. So the fact that Marty team carried out a very high resolution photogrammetry survey and using both a, a, a camera fixed above the stone and also a drone as well. And you can see working in the stone here that we're we're either in socks, bare feet, or crocs, or rubber shoes whenever we're walking in the stone. And everyone who visited the site stuck by that um, that rule. And also the um, HES digital documentation team came along and did a bit of a laser scan as well of the site. 
And so we had an amazing, powerful data set collected over a few days. And the camera in the foreground of this image is from a um, History Channel documentary that was done on the site that was broadcast as part of a series called Project Impossible, where they managed to speed up my voice to make me sound like um, some kind of cartoon character, a cartoon Scott in the video, which is really embarrassing to watch it now <laughs> back. But um, it's nice to have their footage because they had drones and things and they made it look all fancy and, um, and of course, made lots of comparisons about how we... Or they, they said that we basically had helped to solve the problem of Stonehenge through this piece of work here, which is literally rubbish. But anyway, that's, that's American TV for you. Then at the end of the process, um, we buried it. But we buried it again. Um, we put down some geotextile and some other material just over the surface of the stone. But then we buried um, it back under the soil again, and then it ended up being the grassed over mound that you see in the picture that I showed you earlier on. And this is one of the the things going forward is, is how we is reflecting what we do next in terms of this site itself because. Um, of course, there's this incredible heritage site that we could uncover again. Um, or we could do other things. We could create a replica of it using the 3D and photogrammetry data we've got. Um, or we could do a combination of the two, a kind of hybrid, or we could, or, or nothing might happen. And there's, and all of these options are still on the table. And most of these options are quite expensive, um, but are also something that will involve lots of community buy-in and consultation, which is really where things have started to go since this work finished. Oh, oh. In terms of the... Um, the data from that survey, uh, we've uh, I've already published a, um, a provisional analysis of this in the Scottish Archaeological Journal a couple of years ago. Um, and any of the papers that I mention during this talk, if anyone wants a copy, just uh, email me and uh, I'll, I'll send you a PDF because uh, they're not all available open access or on um, or easily found online. Um, but it, we, the data is incredible. There's a 3D model, a 3D viewer, which um, I think is still live through Factor Marty's website, um, where you can play about and zoom in to the data, and you can look at all of this, the rock art and the graffiti in enormous levels of detail. And there's still work to be done in this in terms of um, looking at, for instance, the manner of the pecking of the rock art. How was it created? Looking at things like phasing and erosion and so on. And there's lots of stuff we can still do with that. And um, there's still ongoing research that has to happen there. Um, and, you know, what? this is a sort of, again, a provisional drawing, which is the first new drawing of, of the stone that was produced um, for many decades. And it, and some of the points that I've known include this really dense concentration, which is right at the top of the mound, which is where Ludovic Mann was kneeling in the image I showed earlier on. Some incredible giant cup and ring marks, which are almost a metre in diameter here, which Ludovic Mann was fascinated with. Um, and then the little footprints were kind of down here, the four-toed footprints, and we did indeed found them, and they were indeed four-toed footprints. And then there's all sorts of other bits and pieces around as well, and very dense concentrations. Um, and so, it's a remarkable site, and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of work still to, still to be done in terms of characterising the rock art on the surface of the stone itself. I've also been trying to make sense of what Ludovic Mann was up to because his paint job was incredibly elaborate. Um, and complicated and probably took weeks. But unlike um, most of um, Mann's work, he actually didn't really do much publicity about this, nor did he um, really write much about what he was doing here, which is very much not in character, because usually he had everything he did, he told a newspaper about. But in this case, there's very little in the press about the painting of the site, maybe only a couple of short articles that don't tell us much. Thanks to uh, Katinka Dalglish at Glasgow Life, this amazing picture resurfaced about 18 months ago of Ludovic Mann actually painting uh, the Cockno stone with a, a rather coarse looking paintbrush. It's surprising um, how uh, messy this looks considered, considering how accurate and, and tidy the paint job is. And also this um, white bit of material with stones laid on top suggests that he's also doing a rubbing at the time as well, because that's how he did rock art rubbings. So I guess there's a possibility that in Ludovic Mann's archive, and there's still some of the archives never been looked at, um, there might be a, a rubbing of a bit of the Cochino stone, which would be a massive bit of paper. Um, so that's something that's still out there. And you can see in the, the, the image here, these incredible yellow lines that have survived in the bits of the stone that were grassed over in the decades after man did his paint job. In terms of what he was up to, um, again, you can read about that in a paper that I published in SAGE uh, a few months ago about what, he was, what was going on here. But essentially, there's a combination of prehistoric cosmology, Ancient measurements that man thought were common to all of prehistoric societies, 
and uh, various other allusions to other monuments, um, including the, the Druid Temple site, which he excavated in Clyde Bank. And this is the, a sketch of uh, where I attempted to try and capture what he was doing in relation to the rock art. And of course, he painted the symbols as well. He, he painted the um, he painted some of the graffiti because he thought it was symbols. He made up his own symbols that weren't even on the rock. He painted circles on it. That are, there's no logic to it. There's numbers painted onto it. It's mind boggling, um, but also fascinating as well. And the only thing that man ever really wrote about the Cochino Stone was in uh, the late 30s when he was excavating the Druid Temple in Yoker in Clyde Bank. And that's another whole crazy story in its own right. Um, as part of this, he published a book called The Druid Temple Explained or a pamphlet. Uh, and within that, there's this image on the left of the slide here, which shows two of the big cup and ring marks on the Cochino Stone and Ludovic Mann's interpretation of what this was all about to the people who carved it in prehistory. And essentially, it's about eclipses and it's about cosmological battles and stories being told by people in prehistory to explain astronomical events. And so every one of these rings represents a different planet. Um, and it's all about um, kind of explaining things that are going on like eclipses. So, for instance, he talks about the eclipse, eclipses being explained in prehistory as the sun being swallowed by a monster and then the monster regurgitating the sun again because it's too hot to handle. And and that's where the, so the sun disappears. And so there's this kind of eclipse monster narrative which runs through his story, which is really remarkable stuff and, and very much in the, the vein of man's eccentric interpretations of the past. He was also, he also um, marked up a lot of other megaliths in central Scotland as well, although it's worth noting that um, he used chalk in every other case, uh, and there's some examples on the slide there. And also, he did also use chalk on Stonehenge in the 1920s against the express permissions of the Ministry of Works, um, because they said, you can come to Stonehenge, but don't put chalk on the stones. And then a few months later, a photograph appeared in a newspaper of one of the blue stones at Stonehenge covered in chalk. So a man was someone who could not be controlled. Um, now, the other element of this is the graffiti and the historic graffiti and the, the additions to the stone are very much part of the story. They're very much part of the archaeology of this site. And uh, Alison Douglas, uh, who works works with me, she does the social media for uh, the project. She, uh, at the time, was doing a dissertation and she looked at all of the graffiti and she documented over 100 different individual bits of graffiti on the stone, mostly names or initials, some of them carved um, uh, quite incised in various different ways, quite deeply. Um, and we we documented and recorded all of these. And it's very likely there was also some fake or some very bad hoax cup and ring marks carved into the stone at this time as well. There's a few examples in the top left of this slide where there's a couple of cup and ring marks which, which are just rubbish. And I'm fairly sure that they're probably someone attempting to replicate this in the 1950s or something like that, and then realizing it was much more difficult than it looked to create these shapes. And that's been a very valuable resource of a source of information as well, and something we've been taking very seriously when we talk to the local community. And we managed to get various images from people locally, which again just show the, the the scale of the stone, the paint on the stone, and how bright it was, but also start to hint at the way that the community were using this monument. So the picture on the top left is a lady who went up to the Cockno Stone on the on, on after she was married. And there seems to have been some tradition of this happening locally and faithfully where people were going up there um, on their, their wedding day. Um, and there's and there's also clearly, um, clearly kids are playing on the stone as well. We've spoken to people um, since in the last few years who, when their children um, were playing on the Cochino Stone and they played marble games. And during the excavation, we found several marbles at the bottom of the slope of the stone, which are, were left behind by kids who were playing on the stone before it was uh, buried. And... Also, when people were visiting, they were carving their name on it as well. So we've spoken to uh, a couple of people who have admitted to carving their name onto the um, stone, including a local guy whose initials are BS. And he told us that he broke his pen knife when he did this when he was about seven or eight, when he carved his initials onto the stone. Um, and this picture on the bottom here has got two um, local guys who are called Smith and Cairns who um, visited the stone and had this nice photograph taken. And both of their names are carved onto the Cockerel Stone right next to each other, which again gives a nice connection. And it's possible that actually the carving happened on the day that photograph was taken, which would be very nice. So during the excavation, 
And in the following months, we started to speak to people, we started to pick up on these stories, and we started to realize that actually there was there was more to this than just a prehistoric site that, that needed traditional kind of prehistoric archaeological analysis. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Now, this this is not also just about the Cochno Stone, although initially I did think it was, but gradually it became clear that there was that the other sites in the area were also worthy of exploration and perhaps were more useful because they're still extant and you can still see them in the landscape. And he also um, hinted at a whole network of places that lo the local community knew about and the archaeologists had not really spent much time um, paying any attention to. So these sites, and I showed this image earlier on, these, these dots in blue, um, one of the things I'm going to, I've been trying to do, and I started in 2019, was through survey and then excavation, try and explore all of these rock art sites. And so in this image here, the circle, the red circle is around the Cochino stone, and the white circles are the two places where I've excavated so far. The left hand one is Achna Craig, and the right hand one is White Hill. And I'll come I'll come back to those one again in a few moments. But my plan is, unfortunately, of course, that's been it's been delayed by 18 months by the pandemic. But my plan is to try and carry out excavation work at as many of these other sites as possible. So there's at least 15 other panels in the area, and none are as, as spectacular as the Cochino Stone, but nonetheless, there's some really cracking sites um, with some deeply incised cups, quite a few of things as well. And some of them are very easy to find, others are a bit more challenging, and we had to have local people show us where they were because they're so difficult to find. And another one that, we, one that was revealed during the Scotland's Rock Art Project survey in, 20, in 2019, um, top right here, Acne Craig 4, has got a lot of red paint on it, but it's much more of a someone's just got a can of paint and thrown it on it. It's something that's not, this is not um, Ludovic Mann-esque painting of the stone. Um, so there's, so these are stones that have had a colorful, a colorful time over the last few decades. So in March, 2019, Scotland's Rock Art Project came along and they did a, a few weekends of training and survey work where we uncovered and we looked for and found all the panels that we could in the area. They were all uncovered um, as far as possible um, because they don't excavate, they just uncover panels um, to their extent. And all of them were recorded through paper forms and photogrammetry using their standard recording. And the great thing was that there was a really mixed team here. It wasn't just um, it wasn't just scrap people, it wasn't just students, it wasn't just ACFA who are kind of um, survey volunteers who are based in the Glasgow area. It was also members of the local community as well who were involved in this and were able to pick up the skills and learn how to do this recording. So it was a really nice team and a really nice dynamic that, um, over that, that um, those survey events. And we had some training sessions and also an, an open day where we had um, things on display. Stuart Jeffrey did interviews with some local people about the how they value the rock art. And also there was some amazing rock art by Lucy Killerin that was um, that was put up on the wall in the local community centre. And Lucy's now actually doing a PhD with us in Glasgow, so I will be exploiting her skills in the coming years um, and her interest in rock art, which is part of her final show in her, as part of her art degree in Edinburgh. Uh, photogrammetry was undertaken of all of the sites in the area. And if you go to the Scotland's Rock Art Project Sketch Fab site, you can see all of the photogrammetry and play about with the models and make them spin around. I mean, I didn't do it here because I thought it would break my PowerPoint. It probably would have. So you can do that at your own leisure on their Sketchfab site. Um, and they're very impressive and allow you to look at the rocks from all manner of different details and see some of that level of detail. Um, and the excavations I carried out were fairly limited in their scope, as is often the way with rock art sites. So um, Achna Craig in 2019, uh, I excavated, um, we excavated around two rock art sites and uh, we didn't really find a huge um, amount of exciting stuff in the, in the sense that we didn't reveal anything prehistoric. We didn't find any uh, features in the natural that we could relate to the, the, the rocks. And indeed it was difficult to find the natural because there's so many rock outcrops here. Um, we did find a cup marked stone that had been built into the, the little garden wall that you can see in the photograph in the, in the middle right. Um, so that was a nice new mobile um, cup mark discovery. Um, and it was very clear that this rock art site was actually a garden feature. And there was a very big house here at Achna Craig until about the 1980s when it burnt down. And so this is, and there was a lovely lawn and it was a very nice, well-maintained garden of a well-heeled house. Um, which is now part of the, the local park. 
it's very difficult to to read this into the landscape now. But it's it's what was happening was that a wall was built in the garden, and the wall was built up to the rock art site. And there's a little entrance gap there, which is presumably where people would go through and then walk up on top of the rock art, and then they could enjoy it or they could it could be shown off to visitors. So it was nice to see that the rock art being incorporated as a as a garden feature. We didn't find much else though of excitement to be honest there, but it was a nice a nice week of um, digging some very aesthetically pleasing trenches. Um, later that summer, we excavated at uh, Well at Well Hill. I'm just going to have a wee drink of Iron Brew. We uh, excavated at Well Hill, mostly with a student team this time, and this is a bit more off um, the other side of the the park to the north of Faithley. And we excavated around three panels, and essentially these are this is a really big ridge. And it's just all outcrop. So whenever we opened trenches, we just found more outcrop. We couldn't find any natural to um, help us find any features associated with the rock art. But we did uncover various previously unrecorded features at these different sites and did some photogrammetry recording as well. And we uncovered this really massive outcrop at White Hill 3, which is second only in size to the Cockno Stone in the area. And it was nice to get a sense of the rock art here not just in terms of the symbols, but also the connections the symbols have to the natural cracks and crevices in the rock. So that was a, a nice a nice case study in, the, in that kind of synchronicity that you often get with these sites in prehistory. Um, this is this is not the first time this site's been uncovered. Ronald Morris uncovered this site in the 1960s, and he recorded all of this stuff previously. But it was nice to go back and to do that again and to use more up-to-date recording methods and also compare what we found to his um, notes. So that's where we are just now with in terms of the archaeology. And, and this summer, we're planning to go back and do some socially distanced excavation uh, at, at another few of the Achna Craig sites, um, hopefully getting the local schools involved in those excavations. Um, but also from early on in the process, I was very keen to um, involve the, the community because the community are right on the doorstep. And this is something which is of great interest because we knew that from the amount of people that visited our excavations from school children right up to um, pensioners who had all shared all these wonderful memories with us. And so we've heard, held quite a lot of public um, consultation events with or local organisations and, and community groups and people. Um, we've done uh, walks around the park. We've gone and looked for rock art sites with local people who have been able to show us where rock art sites are, where scrap archaeologists couldn't find them because ultimately we're dealing with people who are experts in where they live, um, which is which is invaluable. And so we've had lots of these events. And one of the things that we've been trying to do is to raise awareness locally of the rock art, but also we're trying to get to a position where we can do start to do things on the ground that are not just about excavation and survey, but actually are involving other things, you know, maybe the creation of a walking trail, maybe more information available locally, art in the area that might relate to the rock art as well. Lots of potential things that we can think about doing. There's been a lot of school engagement um, over the last few years as well. Um, and I've spoken about this a couple of times in the last few weeks at other, at other events and, and meetings and conferences. Uh, but essentially, right from the start, we had children visiting the excavations at, uh, at Cockno. And when I went in to speak to the kids in the local, there's two local primary schools, Eden Barnett and St Joseph's, what really struck me was that quite a few of the kids ha had spoken to their parents because of the excavation and had found out that their, their mother or their father or their grandparents had, had carved their name onto the Cockno stone and were admitting it. And, and it brought back lots of memories. And it was nice to have those connections made from these sort of six, seven year old kids. And really from then, I just I, I started to do various improvised um, teaching sessions and, and different things that were that were some were formal, some were informal that I could use in local schools and also elsewhere as well. And so there's been, you know, hundreds and hundreds of kids have been exposed to the story of the Cockno Stone, the cup and ring mark symbols, and Ludovic Mann and things like that, you know, which is exciting. And it's been it's and it's been a, a really rewarding part of the, the project and it's still ongoing. So, you know, for instance, in 2017, I got some money from the Being Human Festival to design a comic book with Hannah Sackett. Uh, which was um, essentially telling the story of Ludovic Mann's relationship with the Cockno Stone, and uh, this included the um, getting the kids to to um, in comic book workshops, getting the kids to draw their own eclipse monsters and imagining the sun being eaten by a monster, and they also do their own comic strips about 
the Cockney Stone, about cup and ring marks. And then at the end of the session, they get to take a comic book away. And part of the logic behind this was that we wanted them to take that home and show their parents and then raise awareness of the project and of the rock art amongst the bigger constituency. And we also held an exhibition in Faithfully of the of the Eclipse Monster drawings done by the children. And this is transferable. So I've, I've ran this workshop in several different schools. And in fact, in the next um, few months, I'm going to run it at several new schools as well, because the Society of Antics of Scotland um, provided enough money for me to buy another 500 comic books to use and to give away to the children of central Scotland, which is uh, something that I'm planning and doing in the coming months. So there's a lot more e Eclipse Monster drawing um, to be done, which is exciting. Uh, I've also been doing this thing called the Chalk No Stone, uh, where uh, we essentially we get out in the playgrounds, uh, get lots of play playground or pavement chalk together, and then we the kids help me to draw an outline of the Cock No Stone at one to one scale. And so it's big, and then they get to fill it up with all sorts of cup and ring mark symbols, uh, but also they get to add their own symbols as well after that as well. So the idea was basically that is we can then talk to them about things like identity and how we identify ourselves, what are what are symbols, what why do they matter, what are cup and ring marks, and all those kind of things. And it's a lot of fun. Um, and you know, as soon as it rains, it's gone. Then you can do it all again. And that's again has been done in a number of different schools. I've got another school or two lined up to do that in the in the near future with as well. Another thing which is which has been really interesting is that is that. Of course, I'm not the first person that's tried to do this kind of schools engagement, um, and and over the the last few years, it's emerged that these other things have happened as well, which have been of mixed success. So, um, there's a there was a mural many years ago on the gable end of one of the buildings, at Faithfully, which was called Faithfully Past and Present, and it was um, designed by our um, local artist Tom McKendrick, but it was done working with uh, local school children, I think from Eden Barnet Primary, and essentially. Um, it's just about all of the images that the kids said summed up where they live. So it's a windy place. There's lots of blackbirds flying about, but also you can probably see in the background of this image in the middle of the green field, some ghostly cup and ring mark symbols that are from the Cockno Stone. And so we have this public art that was there 15 years ago or something like that, that was reflecting the cup and ring marks. But this was just removed when they were renovating this block of flats. They just took this down and threw it away, which is a, a real, a real shame. And the artist was very upset about it. Um, but also, and still extant, are a pair of sculptures at the both of the entrances to Faithfully by the uh, well-known artist Andy Scott, who, for instance, designed um, the the Kelpies in Falkirk. And he again worked with community uh, with community groups and with local kids to um, design these sculptures. And you can't really see in this photograph here, but all of the all of the way around this kind of outer metal pole thing. Um, there are cup and ring marks carved around it. So this this is again very much about an embedding of these symbols within within the community. And I think that we can do much more to make the symbols a presence within the community that um that that, that essentially is part of everyday life and, and that people will see them all the time. And that's one of the things that I think we we should be doing going into the future. Now there's no doubt that this is a, a very engaged community. You know, right from the start, when I um, when I was there looking at rock art sites, um, like the Arkna Craig sites, local people would walk past and they'd, and they'd just start to say, tell me what it is. Oh yeah, that's that 5,000 year old rock art, and, you know, and stuff like that. And they would be really engaged. And and, and I thought, this is amazing. You know, these, these people really know their stuff. You know, they really know what this, the, the, what this, what this rock art is. Um, and as I said already, I've spoken to people who, played in the rock art sites when they're kids, they've gone looking for rock art, they know what it is, you know, so it's a very engaged community. And it was, and it was, um, and that's perhaps best represented by Gordon, who I think is actually in the audience this evening, um, or one of the, one of the participants in the audience. And uh, this is Gordon in a picture that was actually put into the Sunday Post, um, and in a story that was done primarily about um, Gordon and, and, um, and his local expertise, uh, one of the, one of the stars of the Faithfully Rocks project. And, there are there are people locally who just, who just know this stuff really well because they grew up playing on the rock art. They grew up playing on the rocks. They know this. They know where things are, and there's other sites to be found, I'm sure, as well. We can follow up some of those leads from um, various local people. And there's a picture there on the top right of of BS um, repro um, reproducing his BS initials carved onto the stone by painting them onto these kind of Lucy Killeran's artworks on the side of the wall there, which is a, a seminal moment for us all, including including BS himself. 
But I was f fortunate enough in, um, in 2019 that Now's Housing Association, who I've done a lot of work with on this, which is the, the housing association that owns about 90% of the local housing, um, they have a, they um, run a, a big survey every three years, and they, they put in a few questions about the rock art, which is really fantastic for me. And also, it, it gave a real sense that this is this, there's a, something really special happening here. So, you know, for instance, this is this one here. How much do you know about the rock art? There was 729 people answered this question as part of the um, the survey, and you know the like the red color is I've heard about it, but I don't know much. But that's like almost 50 percent of these people. Um, the greeny color is I've seen the rock art in the park, but I don't know what it is, which is about 20 percent. And then there's a smaller chunk who say, I know lots about it and I visited the rock art sites, which is still about 10%. So, you know, there's only a third of people who, who asked, who, who were asked this question, didn't know anything about the rock art, which is very heartening. And then when people were asked the question, what would you like to ha happen with it in the future? Which I, I acknowledge is a leading question because most people are going to want something nice to happen. Um, there was a lot, there was, you know, there was 300 people said the rock art should become an important part of Faithless future. Um, 350 people it should be cleaned up so that uh, people can visit it and use it. Um, and, you know, again, almost 350 people said signposts and information boards to help us understand the site. So this is a community who are engaged, informed and want more. And that's something which hopefully we can deliver in the coming years. Um, I've, we've set up a group, although it hasn't really done very much so far, unfortunately, but it, hopefully that will change in, in the near future. The Friends of the Cockno Stone, which has got these objectives um, to uh, and um, and is and is run by um, both members of the community um, from Now's Housing Association, Faithful Community Council. Um, I'm involved and 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 also the local MSP, although he's stepping down um, in advance of the elections, um, taking a well-earned retirement. Um, but that means I'll just put him to work as a volunteer for the project instead. And so and and this is very much got the aspiration to try and coordinate events and things and and to, and to use the rock art for the benefit of the local community. And the thing that really inspires me about this is the fact that one of the things that they've talked to me about, the local people, is that they want to rebrand Faithfully. They want to change Faithfully from being this this horrible place that people say is rubbish to live to being Scotland's rock art capital. And so, and, and why why can't we have a nice brown sign that, as you come into, um, the, into Faithfully that says, Faithfully, the home of the Cockno Stone, Scotland's rock art capital, Two footprints with four toes, you know, it's it's not a crazy vision, and I think it's something that we can make happen in the coming years with the community in um, buy-in and, and support. And I, I guess this really brought me up to, and this is really the end of phase one, I suppose, um, which is just pre, of course, um, first lockdown last year, when we had a a parliamentary event um, in the Scottish Parliament, uh, and this was an event that was organised by Gil Patterson, the MSP. Um, and he organised a debate in Parliament, which was about the social value of rock art. Uh, and there was quite a few MSPs talked about it. Um, and Fiona Hislop, the, um, who's partly her role as culture secretary, um, said some very nice things about the project and also more generally about the value of archaeology and heritage. And then, and, but, but the thing that was really exciting for me about that was that you can see in the top right here, this is the gallery in Parliament. All of the front rows are all primary school kids from Faithley who are in the Scottish Parliament hearing MSPs talk about how great the place they live is. And that was such a, a powerful moment for me because these are kids who grew up in a place that people don't like and, and people tell them it's rubbish. And they got on a bus and they went all the way over to Edinburgh to sit in the Parliament. And that was an incredible experience for them and an incredible experience for us as well. And we get into all sorts of trouble because we gave an applause at the end of Gil's talk. And then the Speaker of the House told us that we don't applaud in this house, so we weren't allowed to do that. And then, uh, and then apparently, I also made a fool of myself on Parliament TV as well. Um, that's a that's a different story. But after that, we had an amazing event, um, a, a reception in a in a committee room at the Parliament that was um, again hosted by Gill and Fiona Hislop spoke there. Ads, I spoke, but also school teachers spoke. People spoke from the Community Council, from Now's Housing Association. School pupils spoke, and also. Um, people from a local social enterprise magazine, the Clyde Sider, spoke about this as well. And they spoke about the rock art, what it means to people there, and what it could do in the future, how it could potentially change things um, for the more positive for the people who live in Faithfully. And it was a very emotional evening, and Gil was, you know, shedding a tear towards the end of it all. Um, and it was a very powerful evening. And in a sense, it was really 
a real shame that almost immediately the, the kind of the, the shutters came down and that was kind of it in terms of being able to do things in person. And we're only now really coming out of that now. So that's where we got up to towards the end of uh, last year. But that was for me, again, it wasn't so much about, you know, the, the prehistoric rock art or, you know, the, the archaeology. It was more about what that meant to people who, in some cases, uh, two years previously had, had never heard of the rock art. They didn't really know about it. They knew nothing about it. And then suddenly now through helping on surveys, through learning about it, through talking to people locally, they, they really loved it. You know, they really were passionate about it and they, and they found they really felt as if it could be transformative for their community. And as an archaeologist, that's about as humbling, I think, as it, as it gets in terms of, you know, the stuff that we do. And this is the slide that I showed um, at the end of my introduction to that parliamentary um, event. Which, which was something that really sums up what this is all about. And it sums up in a way what urban pre history is about as well. Um, because ultimately, it doesn't matter how crappy the place you live is perceived to be. It's very likely that the place that you live has been special to someone um, over many occasions, over thousands of years. And I think that's a really powerful thought. And that's something that I felt was really worth sharing with the audience that night. And it's something that, you know, it, it keeps me going. Um, and, it, and it makes me really keen to go back and do some more uh, at Faithfully. So in terms of what happens next, um, Faithfully Rocks, which is the sort of the, the project, again, a name coined by um, the, uh, Sandra from the local um, um, now housing association. Uh, Faithfully Rocks will resume again this um, the spring summer. We're going to go back and do a bit more excavation. We're going to start doing things again. I'm going back into schools again in the next um, couple of months. Uh, and we're going to try and finish off these excavations, but we're also going to try and make things happen. So we're going to resume or re revisit an HLF application to um, create a walking trail within the park with signage, new um, um, notice boards and information, new footpaths, and also open up access to sites that are currently partially buried or not or not easy to get to. Um, the Cockno Stone and what we do with that is going to be the next phase of that, that we're not going to do that for the time being because it's too big and expensive to take on. But there's also um, potential to explore that branding, to explore how we um, have public art or something else, and we have the presence of the cup and ring marks throughout the whole of Faithfully, um, and signpost people to come to Faithfully to come and see the rock art um, and come and visit um, these um, really amazing sites. Because at the end of the day, if you want to see cup and ring marks and you live in central Scotland, you could drive to Kilmartin or you could drive to Kirkudbury, both of which take hours, and you have to have a car. Or you could go, or you could jump on the number two bus um, from Glasgow and go to Faithley, and you know so it, it, it democratises rock art. It, it allows access to sites that are often rural and difficult to get to, and it's right there on people's doorsteps in the, in this massive urban area within half an hour of half a million people. So there's a huge potential for this to become something much more exciting and important going forward, and I guess there's also all the excavation stuff which could produce some exciting results as as well. So I think I will stop at that point. I think that this, this is project's been in the work of loads of different people and who have helped over the years um, and who are still involved in helping going forward. And a lot of people have given up a lot of their time generously because as with many of my projects, there hasn't been a lot of money been put into this. It's been done on the cheap, um, but I'm hoping that's going to change in the next few years and we manage to um, we manage to do some stuff that's really transformative and start to bring in some um, some grants and things to start to do something really exciting on the ground. So I will, I'll finish at that point and um, pass you back to Antonia. Thank you very much for listening. Oh, thank you, Kenny. I think fantastic. That was that was really really great to hear. And and just in so many ways, I think just really kind of interesting approach. Just in the long biography of the site and kind of really championing all the different aspects of that. A fantastic model as well for kind of archaeology engagement and great art and archaeology projects throughout as well. Absolutely love it. Um, we've got a few questions. If you, if you, if you be so kind, if you, if you've got the time, and a couple of great yes. suggestions as well. Actually, uh, we've got a great suggestion from Jamie Stuve, who's doing the art and archaeology MA, who suggests that the four-toed footprints would be great little directional symbols on the trail when you get to do the trail through uh, the area. So that's a nice uh, uh, thing there. Mm, and, that's a great idea. Um, 
and we've got a question from our own uh, uh, Colin Richards, a bit of a provocation actually, and um, he's wondering whether the stone should be revealed so that marking can continue on the site as a continual process of transformation, sort of kind of championing that long biography of the site. So I don't know if you want to talk a bit about that. Mm. That I mean, that is that is very provocative. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, it's a balance, really, because, you know, on the one hand, I do want to celebrate the fact that this site had a um, had a, a significance to the local community to the extent that they did leave their mark on the sites and people were carving their names on it and all that kind of thing. And that was that happened up until 1965. And that's part of the story of the stone. But I think it would not be helpful to then say, let's just start doing that again and encourage that just because we're in a different time now. We, we know back then. Heritage was viewed differently by society. I suspect that most local people didn't really know how old any of the rock art sites were. No one had bothered to talk to them about it or tell them about it. Um, it was it was different times. I think that um, it would it would just be it would bring very bad publicity upon me and the project if we were to say if we were to encourage anyone to um, to go and add their own graffiti to the stones now. So although. I can absolutely understand the purity of that idea and, uh, and applaud Colin's thinking in that front. I do I do think that that's probably problematic. I mean, you could say the same for Maze Howe because Maze Howe's got this incredible historic graffiti element to it. But, you know, if someone went in and now and carved their name in Maze Howe, it would be in the front page of the Daily Record. So I think that it's, you know, there's got to be some pragmatism about that. I mean, when we actually opened up the Cochrane Stone, there was concern amongst um, some of the team members um, that the the stone would be redamaged again because they thought, well, if we un if we un if we reveal it, then people are going to come and they're going to they're going to throw paint on it, they're going to graffiti on it, blah, you know, because it happened before, it will happen again. Um, and they were saying we need to have security guards on the site, and and I said I said look, look let's not do that, let's just trust, let's just see what happens. Um, and and you know, it was a slight gamble, but also I wasn't too concerned because I didn't think that much would happen when it was so high profile. And ultimately, in the end, the local community policed it because um, when when we weren't on site, like in, in um, the sat uh, in a Sunday or something, I, I'd, I'd heard through social media that there was local people who were actually on the site and they were giving guided tours to visitors, and they were also telling them not to damage it and you know take your shoes off before you step in the stone and stuff like that. So it really heartened me that in fact, far from it being an invitation for graffiti to happen again and damage to happen to the stone. The community were empowered enough to actually police it themselves and look after it. And I think that if, you know, the more we can do in schools locally, the less chance they are when kids are or teenagers that they are likely to damage it. But if it happens, I mean, these things happen. You know, the Ring of Broadgirls had graffiti on it in the last few years. You know, these things happen, but I wouldn't like to actively encourage it. I think that would be, that would be, it just would give the wrong message. Yeah, thank you. And it's a really good lesson in what happens when you let people actually take ownership of their their own local heritage as well. Is yeah. that kind of yeah? You know. But and and I really like the uh, Chalkno Stone and the things you've done with the local schools, which are a way of exploring that sort of mark making without causing damage to the stone and allow to open up those conversations. Mm. Um, we've also got. Uh, Oh yes, good, good uh, related question here from Anna Esteroth. Could you add a new stone nearby, especially for adding graffiti, or and and for learning cut making, um, to for doing cut marking as a skill? So a kind of sacrificial stone, if you like. Uh, like I think there's one in mm. Swanage, isn't there, or somewhere where you can actually carve graffiti to to not do it on the actual site. Mm. Yeah, and allow people to let off some steam, I guess, if they want mm -hmm. to. I mean, I think that's definitely something that would be worth considering. There's a lot of um, natural outcrops in the area and a few big rocks that would work quite well for that. And I think in under controlled circumstances, you could do that. Um, I mean, I, I have sp spoken to people about this and they, they, they're, they're concerned that if um, if the uh, if the cup and ring marks that people do are too good, that they'll end up being confused for genuine ones and that got, there's got to be some kind of um, way of making sure that that doesn't happen in the future. Although I guess that's someone else's problem in 500 years time. Um, but yeah, I think it's certainly something to be worth considering, um, or else, or else having um, public art that um, reflects the the, sim the symbols as well. So, I'm kind of I've sort of got a potential of getting four or five standing stones from a different site in Glasgow. Believe it or not, um, if I can, um, so I'm I'm trying to work out to do that logistically. In fact, I saw them this morning. They're 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 looking very nice. And the idea would be to get those get the standing stones 
to faithfully for the entrances to the park, and then maybe get diff commission different artists to use their imagination and be inspired by the rock art in the local area and then carve the stones in whatever way they see fit. So that's something that I'm kind of trying to pull together as a little project. Um, but that involves various bits of logistics. So that's maybe another way of doing that as well. But certainly I think that it sh there shouldn't be a shutting down of creativity. It should be a, a catalyst for creativity in, in various different ways. Excellent. Thank you. And we've got a question from John M. Uh, can anyone visit the Ochna Craig and White Hill sites any time? Are they still uncovered or have they been covered up as well? No, they're, they're all they're all visible. You can still visit them. Uh, the Ochna Craig sites are just off a path in the park, so they're very easy to get to. They're five minutes walk from the edge of Faithley. Um, and I think that um, they're 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 visible. They're recorded on. Um, they're both in Canmore, obviously, but they're also on um, OS one to fifty thousand maps as well. And you can find the locations of those quite easily. The White Hill sites are again are on a footpath that goes up um, into the hills, uh, and so walkers will pass some of those. But the main big ones that I showed in the slides earlier on are a bit off to the side and in some trees. But again, you can find them if you go off the path and just wander through some bushes, and you can get to them. And they're marked on OS maps as well. So. All of that stuff is is visible. There are a few other sites which are which are buried, um, but one of them is now under a rugby pitch, which was created when the park was made in the eighties. I can't, I don't know why they built a rugby pitch. It's not really an area that's got much rugby tradition, but they managed to they managed to cover over a rock art site that Bono Morris had photographed in the sixties. Um, so there's a few sites that you can't find anymore, but the, most of them are there if you look hard enough. Um, so yeah, there's definitely a good few hours of exploring to be done if you're in the area. Great, thank you. And um, there's been a, a few folk have been asking, saying it's a shame that it's covered over now at the Cockno Stone and you can't see it. And I've got a question from Henry um, asking, does the stone dike still exist, the one shown on the earlier photographs, and does it impinge on the Cockno Stone? The, yeah, so that initially when the stone was found in the 18, 80s and 90s, there was a stone dike that ran right across the stone because it's, a land, it's on a land division, which is in itself interesting. So um, there was a wall right across the stone. So in, once the whole the whole of the stone was exposed, that wall was removed, and then they built a wall around the stone instead, which is a dry stone dike, which you saw in some of the 1930s photographs, when, uh, which is a style to allow people to climb over. So when the stone was uh, buried in 1965, the wall was, was basically pushed over and on top of the stone, believe it or not, because when we excavated there, we found the remnants of the wall um, lying inside the inside the the, the 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 area of the wall so the top few courses were pushed over um so they are so the wall survives but only survives up to about the same height as the stone now the the, the stuff above that was, was was removed so it doesn't impinge on the stone now and it wouldn't be a problem and in fact when we were doing the, the trial excavation in 2015 we actually found the style which is still extant as well which is which is still there so the wall isn't really that much of a, a problem um, but I think it was lucky it didn't damage the stone because I think that they, they pushed the wall over and I think they just pushed it over. I don't think there was any ceremony when they were burying the stone, but the, the fringes of the stone were already grassed over at that time, which is where Ludovic Mann's paint survived. But I think that cushioned the blow of the stones falling, of the wall falling onto the stone. So the wall was not really a, a problem, um, but it was definitely a, a major feature of the site up until it was burial in, in the 1960s. Great, great, thank you. And just one final question, because I realise we've just gone past uh, five o'clock. Um, we've got another question from John M, uh, asking about the full-size replica, uh, which had been mooted uh, during the uncovering. Is there any news on that? Uh, well, we've spoken to Western Bartonshire Council, um, and the, the people I spoke to in the council were, were very keen on the idea. Um, and the idea would be to have the replica near where the original is. The replica would be uh, um, uh, essentially a, a, a printed facsimile, which would be a cement-based material, so it feels like a stone. Rather, if anyone's been to Dunad, you know, in Dunad, there's a um, there's a there's a replica of the of the the early medieval. Um, stone with a footprint and the, the basin carved into it, and you can't really tell it's not a stone. It's so well done. So this would be the same kind of thing, and then there would be like maybe a car park and stuff like that. So there's there's it's definitely on the cards, but I think it's probably three, four, five years down the line. We've got the data, we've got the technology to do it. There's a bit of will, but it needs a lot of money, and that's the next thing. So I think that we have to start off by maybe doing a walking trail 
and improve access to the, the rock art that's currently visible. And then we can move on to the next phase, which is something that's more, more dramatic. And then there's a lot of conversations to be had about uh, the, will the replica be, would the replica be the Cockno Stone 2500 BC? Or would it be the Cockno Stone 1937 with the paint on it? Or would it be the Cockno Stone 1965 with graffiti on it? And and that's an interesting um, ethical issue, I think, in terms of what phase of the the site we actually would replicate, or whether you do something that was in that was maybe a mixture of all. And the thing that that might solve that problem is to have a augmented reality, um, an augmented reality app. So, for instance, you could look at the Cockney Stone through a smartphone or um, a tablet, and then you could turn on the 1937 layer or the 1965 layer, and then you could see it in various different incarnations. And that's something that I've been talking to my colleague, Gareth Beale, about um, developing as well. So again, there's potential to use digital technology to allow the stone to be brought back to life in a range of different incarnations. That's a fantastic idea. And maybe people could even leave their initials or name digitally so they wouldn't well, have yeah. to hurt the stone. But, um, but well, great. I'll, and thank I'll you so much. I think, on, <laughs> I think on that note, because it's five past five and, and Kenny needs a, to take a drink and have a rest and the rest of it. But, but thank you so much for giving up your time on a Friday afternoon, especially at a busy time of uh, teaching semester and everything. And just thank you so much. And just uh, want everyone to give you a round of applause. And uh, great Thank kind of you. comments coming through on the chat. Everyone's saying it's yeah. amazing. So That's thank you so team. much. Thanks.